John, I was going to fire you till just now. You're totally redeemed. So um, we have nine participants, five of which um, are accounted for. So really, there's only four students, Kevin, Jesus, John, and Catherine, and Ugo, five. We have five students. Five students here today, so far. And it's three minutes after nine, and we have 19. Wait, 19? We have 19. 19 people, of which five are here. So we'll just kind of mess around a little bit. Well, Professor, uh, don't take it too personally. I've heard oh. that from so many teachers, you know. Not I mean, that I know. Take it personally. But give me one second. Thank you for reminding me of that. I'm going to go grab my. Uh, fourth <laughs> there we go. So is next week, John, spring break? Does anybody know, Hugo, anybody know, Brenda? Yeah. So we have no class. Yeah, no, no, no class on Wednesday, no class on Saturday. Okay. Did you find that Pat last midterm pretty hard? Uh, yeah, there, there were, there were a, a, a couple of things, at least all of James' questions were from the book, so you, you could look up all the stuff, but that Rodney guy. <laughs> well, uh, I got a couple wrong, and instead of like purloined, you had to have purloin with a plural, purloins. I'm like, come on, come on. Right, so, Catherine, that stuff, Jim goes back through, and you really don't get those wrong, because the, the um, canvas will score that wrong when really you're right so if he doesn't remind him go back through because you have to go back through because you know that's a that's a good answer purloin or purloins is it it's like come on that's a good answer but but canvas doesn't know that canvas, right yeah it just says well nope doesn't even it doesn't even think it's missing the s it just says so right yeah well, i'm I'm past no past, but for other people, they might care. And the other one is I said, you know, end or tail. And uh, it, it because I put or in it, it marked me wrong too. So not for me, because again, I'm past no past. I'm an old lady just learning a lot. But um, for some of the other young guys who might not even look at their tests, uh, just good to know, right? Yeah, yeah. Test. I'll send you a photo of it, Rodney, so you can see it. I screenshotted it when I was looking at it. Okay. Did you just do that? No, no, no. I'll do it after class. I don't want to interrupt. Okay. <laughs> okay, I can send it to you on my phone. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to start. To, I'm going to start taking a roll. Uh, Dario, D. Jesus, Loretto, yes. Yeah, I'm here. Way to go, Jesus. You're here. Did your dad get the job? Yeah, we did. <laughs> Donna. Armando. Armando. Emmanuel Gutierrez. Brenda. Brenda, I know you're yes. <laughs> And Jose Landeros. Here. here. Catherine Lemay. Uh, let's see if Catherine sent me that because I want to 
want to show that. Okay, cool. Um, Colby. Colby. Ugo. Ugo. Yes. Hi. <laughs> what are you eating, Ugo? Scrambled egg with some like that's some peanut and onions in it. That's what I wanted this morning, but I had to settle for cereal. Eric, Mendez, Eric, Kevin, I saw Kevin. Eric. Yes. No Eric Mendez, though. What the hell's happened with Eric? He hasn't been here for mucho weeks. D'Angelo, Rangel, D, D'Angelo, Josh, Joshua Santana, John Sesser. Yeah. Michael Silva. Jose Silva Nunez, yeah. Aurelio Uribe, Dennis Vega. Yeah. Dennis, you were excused last week because you had to work, even if it was a. Um, so, and Aurelio just showed up, right? Yeah, on. no, I'm here. Aurelio, what happened to you last week? I had a family funeral. A funeral? Just, yeah, I forgot to send something out. Right. Sorry. I'm going to give you an excuse for that, but I'm just going to go back on record if you have something going on that you can't make it to this class for instance totally legit reason family funeral you gotta work if you have a reason not to be here if you communicate with me beforehand then you're excused mm -hmm. if you don't communicate me with me beforehand you're not excused it's an unexcused absence i'm giving aurelio a break because it was a funeral okay thanks ronnie yeah, no sweat. Just that I'm so sorry whoever passed away passed away, too. But, you know, um, nobody gets out alive. Yeah. Um, so some, some of the some of the getting out is tragic, I know. But anyway, I digress. So what I want to say is that just communicate with me, man. You can shoot me a text, an email. Just ping me somehow. Let me know you're not going to make it. It's common courtesy communication. Not to mention with, not to mention which. You all agreed. I, I got you all to agree to commit to letting me communicating with me when you can't make it. So, can I get a nod of? Can I get a show of hands? Of, of let's re-up this agreement, Kevin. See if I can get your video. Show of hands. Raise your hand if you agree to be here. If you can't be here, to let me know. Okay, so everybody, raise your hand. Kevin, do you did you raise your hand? Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Yeah, he might have a bad connection, but anyway. So uh, back to the role. Dario, did you make it? Uh, Donna, did you make it? Mondo, did you make it? Armando? Emmanuel? No? Colby? Eric Garcia? Mendez Garcia? D'Angelo Rangel, Joshua Santana, Michael Silva. Okay. So um, I have another class I'm teaching. It's a non-credit. I've never taught a non-credit class before other than substitute for gym. Did I tell you guys about this? I don't think I did. It's two days a week. It's two mornings a week, nine to 12, for seven weeks, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So, um, and it's a little different because the people in that class, I've got 19 in that class, I think, uh, they are not being um, graded. There's no grade, cause it's, not, it's a non-credit, so there's no grades. So there's really, I'm not gonna do quizzes and stuff, but they're getting paid. Yeah, they're getting paid. They're getting paid to come to that class. And they're getting paid to come five days a week, they, they, they sign a contract that they'll do 30, 30 hours a week minimum, I think it is. They'll attend. They won't be more than 15 minutes late. They won't miss more than two classes. The, you know, they, they have to agree to a bunch of stuff. They can't be working. Okay, Kevin. Start it when you can, man. 
All right. Thanks. Um, they have to agree. Uh, they can't be working. They have to have proficiency in English, but there's an ESL component, a big component to it. So it's uh, there's a fair amount of uh, Spanish speakers that speak good enough English certainly to get by. And then they're getting helped. But they're also um, Friday, they do job placement. They're do, getting all this career path stuff. So the program is called Back to Work, BTW. And it's, it's designed in this seven week uh, kind of crash course to get people back to work um, and to pay them $200 a week plus $100 a week per kid for childcare. It's a pretty good deal. But again, you have to be not working to get in that class. And it's too late to get in, I think. But, uh, but those people, the people that are in that class with me, basically it's like a job. It's like, if you don't show up, you're fired. Yeah. Yeah, you don't get a bad grade. You get fired. The two hundred dollars a week. Yeah, you don't get that anymore. So, what if I offered you guys two hundred dollars a week to come to class? <laughs> Brenda says. Jose says. Yeah. Okay. Cool. They're there. So uh, let's <laughs> to get Jose and Brenda here. Wait, we're gonna have to pay them two hundred dollars. Well, wait. You guys always come, so you should be paying the two hundred dollars. All right. This is the kind of mood I'm in today. So roll call, nobody snuck in while I wasn't looking. Okay. So do you all remember how uh, I told you Easter is figured? Does anybody remember? Or did I tell you guys? Maybe it was my other class. I'm getting into it. What was, what was that? Easter. You know how? the date of Easter every year is because by the way the date of Easter is different every different, year. yeah not the day the date even the month right can be different so does anyone here know can you tell me what what how Easter's figured every year okay cool because I'm gonna tell you and I'm gonna tell you a couple of times because Easter's coming up and it's a very important time I think Easter is different every year. It does fall on a Sunday. That's consistent. Every year it falls on a consent on a Sunday, but does also it have, does, does it have to do with Lent? No, it has zero to do with Lent. But it may somehow it may somehow tie in because here's how the Easter figures. Easter is the first Sunday after the full moon after the vernal equinox. Simple stuff. The first Sunday that occurs after the full moon, it's after the vernal equinox. So let's just say, for instance, our vernal equinox is, is today or tomorrow? Today. 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 Yeah, today is the vernal equinox. It's the spring. Spring is today. There's an equal number of light and day. Wow, it's spring. No wonder I'm so excited. <laughs> Half is rising. So, um, so today is the vernal equinox. So the next full moon, I believe the moon is waxing gibbous right now or maybe waxing half full. So it's approaching full moon. Let's say it's full moon in a week. Just pick a day because I don't have it right here. That full moon happens the very next Sunday is Easter. So if you go back, look on your calendar, find out the day Easter is. If you go back a little bit from that, you're going to see a full moon. And then, of course, behind that's a vernal equinox. So first Sunday after the full moon, after the vernal equinox, that's Easter. Isn't that great? You know, if it was me, if I were you, just learning that, if I didn't know that, would be enough. I would just shut my computer off right now and call it. Oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> See you next Saturday. I know. Hasta. <laughs> I would, but I know. Hasta la pista. <laughs> okay, full moon is March 28th. Okay, then mm -hmm. what's next Sunday. And just to let you know that uh, for Passover, Passover is on a lunar calendar, which is much older than the calendar we use. And uh, one year by just the quirk of calendars, Passover came after, which you guys call Passover the Last Supper, yeah. came after Easter, which really shouldn't happen, right? So enough about that, but just to let you know, we're, uh, Passover's on the lunar. I wanna know more about that, but I don't, I wanna figure it out. Um, you and I, but that, stuff like that just enters that. Whole huh. way um, did I get somebody that came in? Anybody come in late? That I didn't. They didn't say here. Yeah, I came in late. 
Armando. <laughs> Armando, Armando, Armando Garcia. Okay, Mondo. What the heck, Mondo? Okay, you're on time. Glad you're here. Glad you're here. But you wanted someone to remind you, Rodney, about uh, talc mine. The talc mine? Oh, God, thank you so much. Okay, so, so we hey, learned Rodney. a bit about... Uh, Rodney. Yes. Instead of uh, our safety meeting, my wife has how sand is formed. And that's not instead of the safety meeting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Remember, Remember the coral sand? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I didn't get, I didn't, I haven't gone there yet, but I'm going to make it. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, it's, it's very interesting how this sand is formed. Yeah, no, it is. Maybe I'll give you a chance to talk about it, but I want to get through a couple things first. In the meantime, the talc. So we talked about, um, you saw the certainty thing, how glass is made, right? How fiberglass is made. We did that last, that was last week, right? Jim said I got ahead of him a little bit, but um, but I want to, uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about um, sound insulation today. Among, I got a real treat for you and I'm, I'm hoping to let you go early, but don't get your hopes up. I may, I may not, <clears throat> but I, I, I want to. But anyway, talc. So I, I didn't bring it and I, damn it, I had it in my hand at my house and then I put it back in this little succulent garden that we have and I thought, oh, I should stick that in the car. But anyway, I didn't. So I got a big piece of talc. It's kind of a, it's kind of a shiny black um, with a lot of like a mica of, um, layers on it. It's very soft. You can etch it with your fingernail. It's, it's what talcum powder is made out of. It's mined. It, uh, it's mined all over the world. The, Chi the Chinese mine it, and theirs is the cheapest talc. Uh, there isn't, there is, uh, there are grades of talc. And artist quality talc is the highest grade of talc. And that is the talc that's the most consistent and you can get the biggest pieces. And when I say most consistent, that it's, it's the pieces of ore or talc are together and not just flaky small pieces. So artists like to like to buy or commission a mine, in this case, the Gray Eagle Mine in the Saline Valley. They will commission that mine to find them um, a piece of talc with, with certain dimensions because they want to sculpt it because it's so soft. They can carve it to make molds. You know, they can, they can carve it really easily prior to making, say, a marble or a stone sculpture. So they'll get a piece of talc. So this Gray Eagle mine is, is in the Saline Valley, which is a hundred mile long valley that sits between the Inyo Kerns to the west and the Panamints to the right. Now it's not that far from Edwards Air Force Base in Mojave. So the jet jockeys love to fly, to drop down off their radar and fly through that Saline Valley really low, like 50 feet off the deck. And it's, uh, <laughs> you see them and then you hear the sonic boom but the saline valley which is where the gray eagle talc mine is i'll tell you i'll give you a little bit of background about it um, there's a place on highway 395 heading up towards mammoth as you're heading up there it's in the owens valley it's called olancha and that's where you turn to go over the town's pass and drop into the north end of death valley about 30 or 40 miles onto that road, heading into uh, past Olancha in the Owens Valley, heading up to the town's pass, there's the Saline Valley Road, and that's the South Pass. There's also a North Pass, which is just below Bishop, maybe it's Lone Pine. But you go over the South Pass, it's, uh, it's can, it's, the elevation is not super high, but it's all dirt road. It's a hundred mile long dirt road through this Saline Valley. You go over the, the South Pass, I've gone over it when it's been, there's been snow. It's kind of hairy, it's not a, ground, not a great road. Then you get down into the Saline Valley, and then it's about another 45 miles of dirt road, of, you know, washboard dirt road. Not, not a very good dirt road. It's really tough to go fast, it's dirty, it's jarring. But in the middle of 
Saline Valley, which is an, uh, an ancient dry lake bed, are the Saline Valley Hot Springs. Now the whole area is uh, Bureau of Land Management owned. And so there's very little controls. It's not like a national forest. So people, our people, human beings from California and all over the world have, have created this, uh, camp, these camping sites around the lower hot springs and the upper hot springs or the palm pool, they call it. But the Saline Valley hot springs are these unbelievable hot springs. So if you can picture yourself in this beautiful kind of natural stone mortared in hot tub with all these crystals embedded in it and you know, the, the water comes, the hot water comes out of this like washboard trough. It's just unbelievable. And then there's a sunrise tub that's, that's up a little bit that you can see the sun go to, you know, come up in. So you're sitting in this hot tub in the middle of nowhere. It's just unbelievable. And uh, you look up and this F-18 is upside down, 50 feet off the deck. It's like, God, did I just see that? And then you see it, then you hear the sonic boom. And you go, yeah, I did this. Just see that. It's a wild place, man. It's uh, most of the people there are naked, so if that's a problem for you. You probably shouldn't go. Um, really, something really uh, worth. If you ever want to go to the coolest hot spring ever, Saline Valley Hot Springs. So, and I've been there two or three times. So I took my kids one time, my wife and kids one time. It was right when the speed limit changed back from 55 to 65 and on the way home i got a ticket for going 66 through palmdale i think it was one irate cop i don't know what the heck was going on with it but anyway i digress when we left one time we were there when we left with the kids that time with the kids we had some of our kids friends too crammed into my truck we went out to the north pass we went out through the valley and out to the north pass because we were told by someone probably someone we met at the hot springs to check out the Gray Eagle talc mine. And we did. We stopped and there was a guy there, I can't remember his name, it's the, the only guy, he lives there, he takes care of the mine, he's the miner. He took his deep off in the mine, you know, with his miner's hat and stuff, took us way up and, you know, showed us where they're mining the talc and then said, okay, I'm, he, he said, he warned us first, but he said, I'm gonna turn off the light. He turned off his headlamp. I wanna tell you, I have never been in that kind of Stygian blackness in my life. It's like it envelops you. It's like it went into my pores. It was as dark as I've ever seen it. You couldn't see, you you know, you nothing. It was a little scary <laughs> to be in a mine too. Anyway, turned it back on and we got to see these, these giant um, deposits of talc because this mine is not a commercial talc mine. They don't sell big giant bunch of talc ore to be crushed up and made into cosmetics and stuff. They have a really good quality talc that they mine and they mine it for artists. So artists from all over the world will, um, will put out an order for a piece of talc X size um, and they go in and find that size, get it out and then crate it up, I guess, and ship it all over the world. So artists can, you know, sculptors can carve it. But the weird thing is, I can't imagine that's cheap either, but uh, that's not what they're car that, that's not the finished product. That's just, they're either making a mold with it or they're just practicing. Anyway, Gray Eagle talc mine, long story, but kind of fun for me to tell. Did we have anybody show up? I don't think so. I don't think Dario, Donna, Manuel, Colby, if I call your names, chime in, Eric, D'Angelo, Michael, no? Okay, so um, by the way, you took a test last week. And uh, if any of you missed things uh, on that test, and I, I, don't, I know nothing about the test. I contributed some questions, but Catherine sent me a, uh, she sent me a screenshot. So, so this was this was wrong, right? She got that wrong. The question is: the blank is the portion of a rafter extending beyond the plate. And she answered, 
the overhang or the tail. And, and just because she put the or in there, she got it wrong. So she actually got that right. There was another one too, another couple of them. Right, Catherine? Yeah. So 44. Come on, flip. <laughs> For additional support of a rafter with an excessive span, blank are attached to the underside and supported by bracing. And Catherine put purlin. But the answer was purlins. So what I'm telling you is that if you, if I was administering the test, so I'm, I'm uh, and I'm not, you'd contact me. So contact Jim. If you've got something wrong like that, which is just an S on the end, because Jim doesn't correct these tests. Um, Canvas does. And so it's just looking, if Perlin is the answer that Jim wrote in there on the answer, and it sees Perlin, it's going to mark it wrong. When really, it's just stupid to mark that wrong. You, you obviously count to do what it was. So. so if you got some stuff wrong, that you think is questionable, don't let it go. Talk to Jim about it and just have him look at it because you should not be penalized for you know dropping an S. Get back here, come on. Hey Rodney. Yeah. On that test too, we were learning stuff in your class, but me and my wife already had taken the test. On Saturday, we were learning lessons in your class that were on that test. We didn't know we had no answers to them because we hadn't been over it. But we started learning this Saturday in your class, but we already had taken the test, so we didn't finish those answers because we didn't have them yet. <laughs> well, that's weird because the answers, the, the questions that I gave Jim, I gave them to him prior to that Saturday, the last Saturday. So I can't explain that. I think you need to take that up with Jim because like I said, typically I design the test, I grade the test, or I've lately the last semester I started with Canvas doing it. But this this testing was all on Jim. He's asked he asked me to provide some questions, which I did late one night, but they were before that class. So I'm not sure what that's about, but take it up with Jim. And then if we need to take it up together, we will. Okay. Yeah, but what I've told Jim I would start doing. In, in which I started last week, is that I'm starting to put questions into my question bank uh, right after we have a class. So there'll be some fresh questions. And I'm trying to not just go with book type questions that Jim can do the book type questions. My questions will be more about the lecture, the video stuff. And if you did not make my Saturday class, you there's a good chance you won't, you won't know even where to look for the answer. In other words, if you're taking the test, you've got some time, you can go to Canvas, you can go click on the Zoom meeting for that meeting if the questions, you know, if you think you found the lecture it's from, and then try to find that content. You could do that. But what's I think a lot better is if you just come to Saturday's class, like all of you are coming to Saturday's class. Now, the fact that it's Easter vacation is supposed to be from the 20th to the 28th. What's the date today? Yeah, it's the 20th. Why aren't we on Easter vacation? I, I don't know. Next Saturday, I guess we're on Easter vacation. So uh, next Saturday, we won't be together. I believe Saturday is the 27th, right? And then we have the 28th, which I could be playing at Spanish Bay. I'll definitely be in Carmel. But Monday the 29th, think of me at Pebble Beach, man. Think of me, even if you um, aren't a golfer, you've certainly heard of Pebble Beach and it's kind of the golf mecca. It's the, it's the place where any golfer in the entire world wants to play once before they die. I've played it twice before. This will be the only time I've played it on my own dime. That is the only time I've ever paid for it myself. But man, I'm just, I'm just stoked. And uh, I'm playing with three other guys and we all got sober in 1990, so we're all, it's 30, 31 years of sobriety times four. So it's 124 years of sobriety playing on that course. So we won't be getting hammered after the round, but we will be having a good time. Okay, let's have a safety meeting. Uh, let's do this thing.
Hey, Rodney. Yo. The next time you're out through there, where you're talking about the talc mine, go to the backside. You ever been to the Devil's Punch Bowl? No, That's Devil's right. Punch Bowl. I sure has heard. I sure have heard about it though. And then, but if you're through there next time, on the weekends, they have those mud bogs out there. You see, you'll see some. I'm talking about some crazy trucks, man. Isn't that one third? Oh, yeah. They, have, they go mud bogging and stuff, man. And the the wheel base is unbelievable, man. In some of these trucks, man. And this is the Devil's yeah. Punch Bowl, and that's out in the Owens Valley, right? Yeah, it's out on the backside of the Devil's Punch Bowl. You know where the I'm trying to think of the name of that park. Uh, they closed it to redo it all and stuff, but but it should be opening back again in 2022. Actually, it should be opening back up with all brand new stuff. But on the back side, right there, Rodney, if you're going through there again next time, on the weekends they have those mud bogging races, man, and you'll see some badass trucks. Bro. Yeah, that'd be cool. I love that. I'm gonna I'm gonna Google that. Okay, so I'm gonna read the introduction and then I'll I'm gonna just call on some people that can please chime in and unmute and read. So this safety meeting we're having is on types of ladders. Uh, introduction, the very first thing employees must decide before actually using the ladder is which type of ladder will work the best for the job at hand. Understanding the different types of ladders and their functions will allow you to make an informed decision. You will then be able to complete your task more efficiently and safely. Uh, okay, so step stools. How about Jesus? Jesus Barreto. Uh, <clears throat> step stools. A, a ladder type step stool is a self supporting foldable portable ladder that is non adjustable in length. Step stools come in different sizes, um, duty ratings, and material. Okay, and let's go to step ladders and let's have uh, Armando read that, please. Step ladders are the most commonly used ladder. Step, step ladders are self-supportable, meaning they do not need to be leaned against any type of support to be used. There are two varieties of step ladders, one-sided step ladder and twin-sided step ladder. Good one. Uh, Brenda, would you please read platform ladders? A platform ladder is a step ladder with the top step being a platform. This type of ladder provides a comfortable work area with a slip resistant platform. Some platform ladders are equipped with guardrails and handles. And, and Jose, read us single and, and extension, please. Single ladders are non self supporting ladders which require to be lean against a wall or other support. Single ladders are a one section non extending ladder. Extension ladders. Extension ladders are also non self supporting ladders, adjustable in length, consisting of two or more sections. Extension ladders are the most popular of, long, of longer ladders they are designed to handle a wide range of tasks in very varying heights. Okay, how about uh, Catherine, would you read about telescoping ladders, please? Telescoping ladder, a telescoping ladder is a simple, is simply a ladder that is able to slide in and out to adjust in size and does so by the use of overlapping sections. Almost any type of ladder can be telescoping, such as step ladder, extension ladders, folding ladders, or multi-purpose ladders. Okay, and then how about Colby? Did you ever show up? No. How about uh, Eric? No. Kevin, Velasco, uh, multi-purpose, please. A ladder that is able to accomplish the tasks of two or more of the other types of ladders can be considered a multi-purpose ladder these ladders get their name from their ability to fold up when not in use for extremely easy storage many folding ladders are capable of holding 250 to 300 pounds or more all right and safe work practices john Cesar, how about you safe work practices when selecting the right ladder for the job employees should use the following safe work practices before use 
Do not use a ladder until properly trained. Consider environmental and job operation factors before selecting ladder. Select the ladder that is the proper length for the job. Inspect ladder prior to the selection and use. If a ladder appears to be in poor condition, tag label damage and do not use. Read and follow all labels and markings on the ladder. Do not remove safety decals from ladders. Do not exceed the maximum load rating of a ladder. Do not use metal ladders near electrical exposure. Only use ladders for the purpose for which they are designed, which includes ladder accessories such as levelers, jacks, or hooks. And in conclusion, there are many types of ladders for a variety of jobs. Understanding the different types of ladders and their functions will allow employees to make an informed decision to complete their tasks safely. Do we have any comments on ladders? All right. Yes. I'm, hey, yeah. sorry about that. But uh, I'm surprised they didn't talk about the uh, material of the ladder, whether it's, you know, fiberglass or electric or, I mean, wood or metal. Yeah, they, they actually did a little bit. They said um, in doing electrical, do not use metal, but they really didn't talk about that. And I, that's what I was, that's one of the things I'm going to talk about, uh, unless you want to go ahead and talk about it. No, anybody else? Anybody else want to say anything about ladders or have an anecdote about ladders or want to tell us about your falling off a ladder experience or anything about ladders? Well, I just have some add, you know, uh, have you seen the two foot ladder? And when you're doing some drywall, like the ceiling, and you forget that it's only a two foot ladder, you go off the other side. I don't know if this happened to John. He's laughing. Wait, a two foot ladder? Yeah, the two foot ladder. Oh, for d doing drywall, and what's the yeah. problem? You think you're going to go higher? Yeah, or you think there's more, and you just <laughs> go off the other side. <laughs> it happens way too often. I've seen it happen to other guys too when I'm around, and I'm just like, damn, this shouldn't <laughs> be laughing. I haven't seen it, and I would hope I would, I could not crack up if I saw it. Like, oh, uh, you <laughs> can't help it. <laughs> you didn't know that was a two step ladder, right? So. I I may have done that on Thursday. But. <laughs> I know. I seen you laugh. I was like, oh, yeah. he knows. Here's my take on ladders. Um, step stools are great. I have one. I love it. A folding step stool. It's light as all get out. It's uh, not super sturdy, but I use it for a lot of stuff, including picking oranges from my tree and, you know, light bulbs and things like that to access in the house. Um, uh, cutting a hedge or two. I've used that. I do not like wooden ladders and I do not like aluminum ladders. Now, wooden ladders are cheaper. Aluminum ladders are cheaper. They're both cheaper than fiberglass ladders. Fiberglass ladder, if you buy a ladder, do yourself a favor and buy a fiberglass ladder. It'll last the longest. You won't get electrocuted when, if ever you get current running through it. They're sturdier. They're just made better. They're lighter. They're, they're just everything about them. Now, um, I've had some ex aluminum extension ladders that I just got them because at the time I couldn't afford, um, you know, it was a big ladder and I couldn't afford the fiberglass, but I have fiber, I have 20 and 24 foot fiberglass extension ladders. I've got, a, I've got ladders I've had forever. You know, if you buy a good, good fiberglass ladder, a good rated ladder, you could conceivably have it your whole life. You could have it buried with you if you wanted. Um, you will not be climbing that ladder to heaven, though, but um, you can think about that. Another thing I'll tell you about ladders is uh, don't, don't mess with a ladder that doesn't work. You know what I mean? That's got a broken, that's a broken wooden ladder, or, you know, needs work. It's just not worth it. And I had a foreman. His name is Bill Chamberlain. He's dead now. He was a great guy. He was uh, Chuck Chamberlain's grandson. Chuck Chamberlain was a phenomenal uh, AA icon. He wrote one of the books he wrote is called uh, A New Pair of Glasses. But anyway, Billy was an excellent carpenter and he was a good job super. And he was on a six foot ladder doing some fascia on a, a pretty tall carport. We were finishing after we built this house and he fell. He, had, he was on uneven ground and he took a fall and he landed on his shoulder and he didn't work for eight months. And he had, he had two surgeries. I mean, it was, it was horrible. It was horrible for him. You know, if you're working for a reputable company and you fall and get hurt, you're going to get workers comp. You know, you're going to get your stuff paid for. 
all that stuff. But you're going to have a messed up, something's going to be messed up. He's got a messed up shoulder. So ask you ask him, would you rather be have nine months off, eight months off and be paid? Or would you rather have a decent shoulder and not have the injury? Nobody wants to get injured. It's your body. You only get one this go around. So please take care of it. Please be safe. Ladders are inherently dangerous. When you climb, that you're, uh, the risk of a fall is horrible. And for somebody my age, falling is probably one of the worst things I could do. Uh, you know, break something because we don't heal as well. And, the, you know, bone density is um, going and all that other stuff. But the ladder that I use the most is a... Uh, Multi-purpose, greatest ladder ever made anywhere. You know, it's a great extension ladder. It's a great um, step, step ladder, uh, multiple heights because it's, uh, it extends. The, it extends and it, it, uh, God, it collapses together. It's uh, heavy duty and I've had it forever, and it's super heavy. It's, it's, all, it's getting to be almost too heavy for me to drag around. Not, not quite, but it's definitely heavy. So I borrowed one from my AV guy when we did the Wii Boost on my fifth wheel, and his was not quite as heavy. So it was a little different brand, same ladder pretty much, but a little different um, adjustments to lock the, uh, the sliding part little easier to do, but it had wheels on one end. So you could get that thing to a place where you could like actually dolly it and you wouldn't have to carry it. It was just fantastic. Love that ladder. So I'm on, I'm on a new kick now. Every 45 minutes, we're going to take a break. We're taking a break right now. I've got uh, 945. I actually got 944. So I expect you back here after 10 minutes at five minutes or after 11 minutes at five minutes until uh, 10 o'clock. Okay. See you back here at five minutes until 10 o'clock, okay? And then we'll come back, all right? All right.
Those are good. No, I didn't pause the recording. So John, try to, try to help me remember to pause when I take a break, will you? Pause during the breaks? Yeah. Okay. Or else not, I guess, but I guess, yeah. I should pause during the break. Next break. So we're we should Say it again. be back. Say how you doing, Rodney? How you doing, Rodney? Good, man. Who who asked me that? Someone you know. <laughs> okay, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I saw that picture of you guys on skis on cross country skis, I just looked at it on my phone. Wow, what a beautiful shot that was, February twenty first. This year, oh, the day before Hannah's birthday. Hey, California's beautiful. Lot to do. I know the young people are working so hard, but lots to go out and play, and it's free. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere I heard that nothing in life is free, but I, I, I am inclined to agree. There's lots of free things. Like uh, last night, you know. Just uh, being out there, <clears throat> just really, it's really different. You know, it's not that far, but man, just being in the in the up in the upper valley and not having the development and the lights and the freeway noise, you know, which you can hear from anywhere in the city. It's it's pretty cool. That's why we like camping, eh? One of the reasons we like camping. I can't wait to see your toy hour. Where 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 exactly are you? Uh, are you camping? Yeah, yeah, we're in site 26 at Rancho Oso. Where, where's Rancho Oso again? I, I recognize the name, but. Well, if you take San Marcos Pass uh, north, <clears throat> go over the pass, drop down, pretty much right when you get to the bottom of the pass, there's Paradise Road. Turn right on Paradise Road, and that takes you by the Paradise Store, Stagecoach Road, Paradise Store, which has been closed for a while. Takes you out past a couple of campgrounds, the headquarters of Rancho San Fernando Rey, um, the headquarters of the Los Padres area there, the National Forest Service is right there, that Sage Hill campground. And then about less than a mile past that is the entrance to Rancho Oso. It's a one mile road kind of up and down. Um, and it's 360 acre cattle ranch, old, old cattle ranch from the 1870s. And it's been a dude ranch. And, and now they have horses and they board horses and they have, uh, it's a great RV campground, like really, really good. Really, I think we've got about 75 or 80 full hookups, a bunch of um, without sewer, a bunch of electric and water hookups. They've got trailer camping. They got horse camping down by the river. They've got giant, two really good, huge pools. One's kept at 85 degrees, big in-ground hot tub, pickleball court. Pretty fun place, lots of trails. We, um, we now that we have e-bikes, of course we've done this on our bikes, but we'll hook up Rocky's trailer and to, and we'll take him to Red Rock. It's about, about another three or four miles from us to cross the river to get to Red Rock. And we can keep going up Camesa Road because you know on bicycles we can get through the locked gate and keep going if we wanted to. It's beautiful back there, upper San Inez River. And it's pretty interesting because when you're in the San Inez Valley, Around Solvang, right? You got pretty much everybody knows where Solvang is. You see how broad that valley is. It's miles across from Refugio, from Refugio to Figaro Mountain. And it's got to be five, six, eight, it's at least five or six miles across. As you come up about 25 or 30 miles up the valley east where we are, it narrows to less than a mile across. So it really just, now you get into this narrow river valley and it's, a, it's just unreal really because um, you have a nice view of the river and you get to watch what the trees in the river do. And my favorite time is to watch the alders and cottonwoods turn orange and love that look. <clears throat> so it right? would have been nice if you could have uh, been there right now and give us a little tour and yeah, <laughs> that would have been know, fun. I may try that too, actually, because I would love that. <laughs> now have we boost out there, and if I can get it, if the signal, we were able to stream movies um, night before last. So if the signal stays good, I, I might try um, doing class from there. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. That'd be 
That yeah, would be yeah. awesome. We're we avid do. campers too, so yeah, that would we, be awesome. We love to camp. We uh, some of you don't know this about me, but Catherine sure does. <laughs> Catherine sure does. But um, in 19, uh, 2015, I inked the deal on selling my construction business, my company, on the 2nd of February. On the 23rd or 26th of March, we bought a brand new Winnebago 33-foot um, fifth wheel trailer. And a couple weeks after that, a month after that, we, we signed a lease to rent our house for six months. And then on May 26th, we uh, took off. We uh, were homeless. We were without a fixed address. We were nomadic. We, we uh, spent the night at uh, John Kenny's horse corral where we'd been keeping our trailer, not, you know, less than a half mile from our house. And then the next day we headed up and uh, met Catherine and Carl at your folks place in uh, Cambria, right? Cambria? And, uh, and then we continued. So we, we were six months on the road on that first trip. We went, um, we went up into Puget Sound, Fidalgo Bay, Anacortes, Wood Bay Island, and a bunch of places in California and Oregon, Washington. I have, I have uh, my sister and a bunch of my uh, nephews and their kids live in Portland. So we spent a week or two in Portland, Portland, and then we crossed the country. And we, when we left Anacortes Island, about 11 in the morning, it was uh, 71 degrees. And when we unhooked our trailer at Moses Lake, Moses Lake, Eastern Washington, it was 122 degrees. Yeah, and our air conditioner was on the fritz. But it's short, all the way across the country. We, we, we wound up back to the factory in Indiana and it got fixed. But um, yeah, our air conditioner wasn't working. It was 122 degrees. We um, went to a show, an air conditioned theater and begged the manager who was a female dog owner to let us bring in our dog, our small Shih Tzu. So we did, but he wasn't having it. <laughs> he was unhappy. You know, the sound effects were just freaking him out. So he was whining and barking and we had to leave. And then we had to go, ah, it was horrible. Why was I telling you that? And then from there, we went across, to, uh, we went to Yellowstone. And then we went to Laramie where her brother lives, uh, University of Wyoming. He's a big cheese there bunch of hiking around Laramie, so beautiful Wyoming. And then down, we went up back, crossed back over the Rockies on country roads to um, Eagle, Colorado. I have really good friends there. And we got into kind of a weird situation there where um, through some, a series of blunders, I ran out of gas um, right before uh, this summit, uh, just outside of Aspen, and it was horrible. You do not want to run out of gas in a diesel vehicle ever. Anyway, then we made it to, uh, we, we went to Kansas and we stayed a couple of weeks with her parents. And then we went to, uh, we went to Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, where I lived in uh, 53 to 58. And then we did this most incredible thing. Well, we went to the house that I lived in from 53 to 58. And my dad bought it brand new on the GI Bill. It was for $17,500 in 1953. It was a split level, three bedroom house on an acre lot. And it was a brand new tract and there were no trees, right? There were just saplings planted. So 60 years later, flash, I'm standing there in front of the house. I know it's the house. I got the assessor's parcel number, I got the address. And I, could, I knew it's the house, it's, it is the house, but it's, there's 65, 70 foot trees behind it and around it. It was just a weird disconnect. And then I realized, oh, wow, yeah. In 60 years, trees grow that tall. And then when we left Parkville, Missouri, we took these country roads um, towards, to, towards Toledo, towards where my parents went in 53. They, they drove to Missouri from Toledo, Ohio, where I was born and where they were born. But I, I just had this feeling that I was on the roads they were on. And it was, it was just, you know, you don't think of Missouri as a really cool place. 
at least I don't usually think of it as a really cool place, but it was so green and it was so pastoral and it was just, I felt like I was on a trip back through time. It was unbelievable. <clears throat> and then uh, we went to the factory in Indiana where the coach was made. We met all the people that built our fifth wheel. We did the factory tour. We got some uh, amendments. We added a TV in the bedroom and another air conditioner had that other one fixed that it's never worked. It's, it's always worked since. And uh, it's built in a place called Shipshawana. That's where Winnebago's towable factory is. Shipshawana has a third lane or a, a, another lane. So it's got a, a lane going this way and a lane going this way on all the roads, right? And then another lane and that lane's for, oh, that lane's for buggies. Yeah, that lane's for buggies because it's Amish country and they and they don't drive a lot. They mostly are on buggies. Really, really interesting. We went to Toledo, Ohio from there, which is a place of my birth that was singularly unimpressed. And then from there, we went to Niagara Falls, which my wife didn't like, but I loved. And uh, I also loved um, hiding my contraband, my uh, pistol up by the Niagara River in the dead of night under an I-beam before we crossed into Canada. And then uh, we crossed into Canada and we have really good friends there. And we, we went up to their cottage, which is three hours north of Toronto, where I opened up the coach like a tin can on this stupid little logging road. It cost $10,000 to fix months and months later when we got back. It was a duct tape fix for three months. But, you know, from, from there, we went to Gettysburg. Um, we, we did all the sites of Gettysburg. We, we got immersed in Civil War history. We went to Charlottesville in Virginia. We went to Monticello. Yeah, Monticello. That's where Thomas Jefferson lived. That's the place Thomas Jefferson built. That's uh, Thomas Jefferson, who's a hero of mine, who I could not reconcile how my hero could have slaves, could, could, um, could participate in slavery. And how when, you know, when uh, slaves were emancipated, he, he still didn't free all his slaves. But I figured it out, you know, after spending some time there and researching it a little bit that Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson and his buddy, John Quincy Adams wrote the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, they wrote it, two guys and the constitution crafted the whole thing that our country is based on. Two humans, really, basically. So this guy Jefferson was an incredible, powerful, incredibly powerful person. How could he reconcile slavery? Well, the, 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 the salient fact was that the America that we know at the time, slavery was so wrapped up in our economics that it wasn't gonna happen and it wasn't gonna happen overnight. And what Jefferson predicted was that it would take nothing less than a civil war to affect that change. And that's exactly what happened. I get emotional just thinking about it. <clears throat> you can imagine what that would have been like <clears throat> for somebody to be a, a slave. So um, before we go any further, <laughs> I want to read you um, just a little bit, a couple of paragraphs from one of my favorite books, The Four Agreements. The third agreement is don't make assumptions. The third agreement is don't make assumptions. We have the tendency to make assumptions about everything. The problem with making assumptions is that we believe they are the truth. We could swear they're real. <clears throat> we make assumptions about what others are doing or thinking. We take it personally and then we blame them and we react by sending emotional poison with our word. That's why whenever we make assumptions, we're asking for problems. We make an assumption we misunderstand, we take it personally, and we end up creating a whole big drama for nothing. All the sadness and drama you have lived in your life. Let 
was rooted in making assumptions and taking things personally. Take a moment to consider the truth of this statement. I'm going to read it again. All the sadness and drama you have lived in your life was rooted in making assumptions and taking things personally. Take a moment to consider the truth of this statement. The whole war of control between humans is about making assumptions and taking things personally. Our whole dream of hell is based on that. We create a lot of emotional poison just by making assumptions and taking it personally, because usually we start gossiping about our assumptions. Remember, gossiping is the way we communicate to each other in the dream of hell and transfer poison to one another. Gossiping. Because we're afraid to ask for clarification, we make assumptions. And we believe we're right about the assumptions. Then we defend our assumptions and we try to make someone else wrong. It's always better to ask questions than to make an assumption. Because assumptions set us up for suffering. Wow. I love that. <laughs> Some heavy stuff, man. It really is heavy stuff. Okay, are we recording? Yeah, good. So um, I thought we do um, what, what I have planned for you today is we're going to I'm going to take us to the book on uh, the insulation chapter and just uh, see if we can just we'll just run through it a little quickly to just kind of recap insulation because we never talked about uh, sound insulation. And I want to tell you a little bit about sound insulation and we'll see what the book has to say. We'll take a break. Well, actually, I want to show you some videos. So uh, show of hands. Uh, I'm going to offer you two choices. One is to get into these flashcards, the book on insulation. The other is to see this video on the Super Tony project up on uh, Campanile Hill. Who wants to see the, the flashcards on insulation? Okay, who wants to see the Super Tony videos on Campanile Hill? Okay. Super Tony videos went out every time because of the way I said it. <laughs> Okay, so just one pause. Um, someone remember to ask me about sound insulation, sound uh, transfer, sound deadening. Um, okay, somebody, uh, before we part company, I want to talk to you a little bit about sound. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to preface with, uh, this is one of my dearest friends very successful contractor, um, really good guy. Uh, he's not as good a golfer as I am, but I don't hold it against him. I gotta have somebody to take money from. Here we go. Okay, we're filming. It's uh, your PT111 instructor one more time, Rodney Up. Hello. Uh, we're gonna be interviewing John. Wait, who's Rodney Up? <laughs> Whole House today, this is my friend, John Whole House. I've known him forever. He we're very good friends and he's an incredible contractor. And he's gonna show you this incredible job and Tell you uh, some uh, some things about him and his company. Turn up a little bit, Rodney. Uh, just could you say that again, please? Can you turn up a little bit? It's a little bit hard for me to hear. Yeah, you may you may be hard to hear my narration, but because I'm not Mike, because a stupid thing won't take two mics, but John is. So let's see, and I'll turn it up a little bit here too. Introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about your some background. How sure. You construction stuff like that. Sure, sure. Um, so you're hearing John okay? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm, this is my 38th year in construction and of, of, of a con having a company, uh, which is 1983, if that's correct. <laughs> um, and I started, I was, I was, when I was uh, in high school, I would do construction with my friend's grandfather. The grandfather wouldn't work with my friend. He wanted me to work with him because I didn't dog it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I got exposed that way. And my parents had a builder friend. And um, I, when I went to school, when I went to college, I would work a semester and go to school a semester, work a semester and save up the money. And then every once in a while, I'd take two semesters off and go travel. But um, John, where was this? that was in St. Petersburg, Florida. 
Yeah. I grew up in Eden, New York, which is a small town near west of Buffalo and a big Buffalo Bills fan. And we're looking for recruits for that. <laughs> so, uh, and then, so, but what got me interested in construction was actually woodworking. And I read a book called The Reverence of Wood. Did you ever see that? It's really, really like was really made wood into this living spirit, uh, you know, inanimate object that was really animal uh, you know they they brought it to life for me and how, how working with wood and how cool that was i guess um and from there i thought well, you know i could be just a great carpenter and travel because i really liked traveling at the time i could travel wherever i want i could put a backpack on with an essential tools and i could go wherever i wanted so that was part of it and then in college i was a political science major Vietnam War was raging, politics was really poor, you know, just a real divided state kind of like it is now. And so I decided that I didn't really want to well, pursue the politics of or, or political science, uh, not to be an attorney or whatever that would take me. So I, I got into construction at that time and um, kind of never looked back. It's uh, I did finish carpentry initially, and I, or, or framing carpentry actually, and then I went to finish, and then I got my contractor's license about seven years after I started. What, what year was that done for? When I started? When you got license. 83. Yeah, so I, I got mine in 81. Yes, <laughs> he keeps that over me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we we're here, we're here on um, 845. See you, Randy. Okay. Second, tell us a little bit more about how you got from being a carpenter to getting a contractor's license to here. Okay. And then, we'll, and then when I say to here, you'll know what I mean soon because here is a fabulous project. In one of my travels, I went to Colorado and I was just going to go there for a little while and I stayed a year. Um, and I. Um, that was from St. Petersburg, Colorado, lived there a year, and then moved to Santa Barbara in 1974. And I was, I joined the union, I tested into the union, actually. Um, so basically, at that time, there was a lot of building going on, framing. Um, and I did framing for in the union for about, I don't know, three or four years. And then I became a finished carpet. I just said, I'm just going to start hanging doors because I part of the fra part of framing then you'd hang doors. Now everything's pretty specialized and you do one thing or the other. Um, I, it was, it was just a uh, labor of love for me. Um, and I, one second, but when, when you and I started, framers hung the exterior doors and windows. Yes. Yeah. We yeah. didn't do that at all. No. And we did the water, water, weatherproofing of them as well. But the, houses were very leaky then, <laughs> you know? It wasn't as tight as it is now where you have the negative pressure on the inside. And so water will climb a window to get in now. Then you, we use sisal craft on the head and sides and and uh, sometimes a, a door panel, you know? So all those door houses in Goleta, the 60s and 70s that grew very quickly, they use some real production methods, you know, which I'm not saying shortcutting, but they were, very efficient and everybody was a piece worker. So you got paid by how many lineal feet or square feet or, or rafters you, you, you put in. Um, so then I came to Santa, well, I did some of that more still in Santa Barbara. I did that for about uh, four years and became a Finnish carpenter. And I, I joined a cabinet shop called Pacific Sun Cabinets. It's, it's where the, yeah, yeah, Skipper and Mark Berry and Mark Davis. Um, and was that all left over from ATN with those guys, some of those guys from ATN? No, actually, uh, maybe Mark Davis, but um, yeah, no, I, I remember ATN. Um, but uh, so we was, it was a very competitive market, the uh, carpenter, uh, maybe cabinetry then, and it still is, I'm sure, but. Um, and we and I was in a very competitive uh, space, you know, as, where the the jobs I was getting was by because I could do them faster and cheaper, I guess. Um, and 
now that you know that's that's i'm not recommending that but it's a good place to to school yourself and get um a co you know accustomed to kind of when it's really slow it gets a little cutthroat when it's really great it's um people the prices go up and you make a little more money you know supply and demand, baby. yeah 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 supply and demand um what else do you need to know um so you uh you when did you become a contractor tell us a little bit about that so so 1980 so i was building additions and things without a license and that's when licenses were almost kind of recommended and not necessarily required but in the early 80s the bank crisis happened and banks weren't going to lend on anybody that wasn't a contractor to build somebody's house so i i went to peerless school and and uh um got the book and read it and i thought i'd go in and just pass it because i had so much experience i loved it <laughs> i passed the the, the uh, business because i studied that the law part and so then i went back a, uh, a month later after studying the book and uh passed it no problem uh but it was some that was very idiosyncratic about the questions and you know things that you wouldn't run into it's super um, esoteric. Yeah. I mean, yeah. questions like when you took the test, it had to be like when I took the test. And that means that when we were asked questions about railway clearances, how many fixture units on a 10 story building, and yeah, yeah. Five, just how much you know, yeah. one inch uh, EMT conduit, what percentage could you fill up with number 12 wire? Yeah. What, why, what, what, how many square foot for a drainage pipe? Uh, yeah. Ooh. And what the distance between a, a, a um, vacuum breaker how high does that could be before the above the p-trap you know something like as a builder as a carpenter you wouldn't know that as a plumber you might know it no, but you, an electrician they what's a meager you know <laughs> so so then you got a contractor's license yeah so just tell us a little bit about where where you went from there You're well the reason i got the job. yeah yeah so i started out with myself and a laborer and we would do additions and we would dig the foundations by hand and we would just charge hourly. And really, I didn't know what overhead and profit was at that time. I was just, I just knew about wages and I could make more if I worked for myself than, than for somebody else that was. Uh, so I started out small and organic. And I went into, so, so I kept my, just friends, basically, I did, and I, for the first, like, four or five years, I didn't even have a contract, and I just, I never, nobody shorted me, but I was a good deal, <laughs> actually, so um, then I wanted to build this house, and I couldn't do it because I didn't have a license, that's why, that, that I was working on Jane Fonda's ranch, and I was looking at this other job up on uh, um, Sierra Sunrise Hill, and off South Sierra Vista, and the bank wouldn't loan on it, so I got a license. And this house was birth or yeah, baptism by fire. We had 50 caissons, 30 feet deep, and it was before the theodolite. It was like, you know, we had the um, what's the pole, the uh, linker rod, and the chain, oh, and it was Steve Davis's first job for surveying it. Yes, he just left the county, and we had to rent the the station. But it wasn't a theodolite. Yeah, it was just it was a it was a survey station. Um, yeah, so pretty cool though. So that was, and he was doing that. Sounds like that, that was baptism by fire. It was a pretty complex. Yeah, it was. It, it was it very expensive. Uh, yeah, fifty caissons and um, grade beams. All the you know all, all grade beams. The, the that day, those days, I think the foundation was one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and I think he paid one hundred thousand for the property. So. And then we built it, it was, I think it was a 66,000, 6,600. And basically it was three buildings going down the, down the hill. Jan Hauser was the architect and stuff. Um, so that was, and that, so that basically that was the start. And I started, then I went to uh, the bank and got some advice here and there. And I got, um, um, and here's my plumber. Thad, come on in here. Thad, come on in here, buddy. Uh, here's Thad. To, the plumber. I, I He's done a great job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Uh, Gray-haired baby. <laughs> Gray-haired baby. Do you need to ask John something? You want me to pause this? Um, no. I mean, I, I need to talk to John about
essentially about a lot of stuff. Okay. Do you have a little time? Thanks, Carlos. I, I, I want to interview him for a while and then walk around with him the property. So we, we, we need about 20 minutes and a half. So, it? yes, but do you want to just put it on pause? So, because you probably have a couple things you want to talk to you about. Real quick, yeah, okay. So we're ready to stop for right now. Or Hmm, no closed captioning. Sorry. Damn. I wonder how that happened. Rodney? Yes. You're going to, um, could you please make it louder? And is there a control on that? Because he's very, he's extremely difficult to understand. Really? Not for me. Is anybody else having trouble understanding John? Because I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble relating to your comment. <clears throat> Is anybody else having trouble understanding him? Okay, I, I don't know what else to do. Linda, I'm going to turn the volume up here, which is going to blow my eardrums out, but I'll do it and see if this helps. Okay, and I'm so Thank sorry. Thank you very much. Hey, no problem. For some reason, this is not um, closed captioned on this one. We're back at it. We're back at it. We're back to court. We're back to John Holels. And so, John, where do we leave off talking to you? We live, we're just trying to get the class to have a sense of how you got from your first job, which we talked about trial by fire, 50 cases. It sounds like a pretty complex job. Well, that was my first job as a contractor. A contractor yeah. A licensed contractor. Now, between then and now, this job, mm -hmm. about how many years? 30. 36 or 37. 36 years. Yeah. And so about how many jobs? I mean, 40 a year, maybe, you know, from different sizes. Yeah, yeah. You know, big mean, house like this. Dozen? Two dozen? Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe 15. Okay. Big houses. Is that this decent. the culmination? Is this the biggest, most complex? This is about the same as a one I did on Barker Pass, okay. which was actually a remodel, but it was a remodel plus we had 12 um water features we had it was just it was so very steep addition, kind of a yeah yeah so as far as dollars and cents that was about so the same as this which brings us to 2021 you started this job in 2020 i do, i started this in um september of 19, 19. 2019 so this job you had all kinds <clears throat> of jobs in between and uh, all kinds of people uh, working for you yeah uh, representing you as job all the way from carpenters, laborers, job supervisors. Yeah, I had 35 employees at one time. Okay. When we were... and now you are the project manager for this. Project superintendent. Project superintendent. Yeah, I'm here every day for 40 hours a week. Every day, 40 hours a week. And that's your deal with the owner. And John, what are we building here? Could you describe it a little bit and then we'll walk over the plans? Well, it's a it's a very contemporary. There was a house here um, that was kind of Spanishy, kind of not real. Uh, it was like a a rabbit worn inside. It was all broken up. It was um, some cracks in the foundation. What we're standing on now, we, we tried to save the foundation of the slab and maybe pour over it with a four inch slab. But when I saw the excavator going across the slab and it was going waving, you know, I said, I'm not putting all that glass on that job. We have a lot of glass in this, so as you'll see when we go heavy on through. Glass. Heavy glass. And heavy doors. I mean, I want to yeah. just pan, I want to zoom to this door right here. This thing, and as we walk through, I will show you the glass that goes in this door. It's a door that's, tell us a little bit about that door. Lock. It's a Rainier, it's been made in Belgium, Belgian glass. It took about three months four months to get um, and it's just kind of uh, meets the criteria of the, of the house. So they're all um, pretty, the, the other glass, the uh, sliding glass doors and windows are from Portugal and they're called Otima. And they're like, um, we had a special uh, is, um, company come in to do the, to, who were certified in installing them and they, um, that was a hundred thousand dollars just for their labor. Yeah, just for the install. Rodney's helping me with my wire. So, and then, um, so that's, uh, yeah. So, but this is kind of for me. Um, I was going to join, you know, the afternoon nap club about two years ago, 
And when my son said, uh, dad, is it too late? He had been a teacher and he had grown up in, with, in the business a bit. But um, so he had been uh, teaching for six years. And, uh, and I said, too early for what? It was after Thanksgiving in 16, I think, or 17. And so yeah, I said, I'll give you a couple of years. But I was going to, you know, I asked you two years ago. You said you didn't want to do it and all that. So, so he's joined me uh, two years ago, and it's been um, really interesting and fun, and um, you know, working with family has got you know, it's everything is. I, I we we communicate very well, so it's uh, we might get mad with each other, or whatever, or say no, you should have done that, or why didn't you follow up on that? And, but uh, the reality is, con. Construction is a complicated business. You need to be organized. And you have a lot of things, a lot of moving parts. And so I figured there's about 1,500 decisions that need to be made when you make, when you build a custom home. Now, there's that's not so true if you're on, um, you know, a model, you know, homes that are basically production homes or anything. Everybody knows what's going to, what that final product looks like. And you know, just fill in the blanks. Non-standard. Non-standard, but you still have to know, you still have to understand what the finished project uh, looks like. Well, you know, it's nice to get a, a rendering from the architect of his intention and all that. So you can follow that as well as the plans. And um, so, and, and basically knowing the finished product and then you go back and fill in the blanks. You just fill in, the, you know what you know what you have to do and, and there's a continuum and things happening concurrently. So I've, so we'll, we'll, maybe we go to the plan that I can show you from kind of ground up. So you can get an idea. And I'm going to walk and show you the house. Excuse the, the mess. So this is the cover sheet. That's the house of the, of the beach. Yeah. Or, yeah. Of the so, ma, so, so. I think so. Uh, something. So this is this is the cover sheet, and it basically shows the map, the vicinity map of where the house is for the city to uh, government to uh, building department to look at. So then this is general notes, and this is this is yeah, yes. This is the they were civil engineers on this. They weren't uh, uh, structural. But this is all kind of grading notes and, and water management notes and the SWPPP notes, which is Storm Water Pollution Prevention Program. It's all civil stuff. Yes, right. Yep. So this, is, this is still a civil site plan, and it's a laid out. Uh, it's got uh, elevations on it. There's a survey uh, topo, these lines in here, you can see that they're what the existing grades, there's 500, 502, 504, 506. So you can see that's a pretty steep hill. It's, yeah, it's steeper as it goes yeah, up. Yeah, and then we have a wall coming. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You, but those, those are um, uh, feet above sea level. That's, right. that's correct. Okay. So we're 520, um, 9, and 0.25 feet above sea level right now. 509. Andy, yeah. Where are we standing? We're standing right now in this garage, okay? And this is the civil plan. It'll get clear. It's, we might not be able to see it. Here's bedroom number one, two, and three. Those are basically guest bedrooms. We'll do this on another page. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but so this is the driving driveway and motor court. And then there's a, it's going to, it's kind of extends down through here. And this used to be a tennis court down here, which is now, um, it's going to be mostly green and, Paths and step stepping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's, yeah, yeah. Here's a little plinth for a piece of art that when you come in, you'll see that. And here's a plinth or stand. Yeah, 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 yeah. It might be a Harley Davidson motorcycle. Who knows? Yeah. So, um, and then here's a. Uh, this is a fire pit, but it's going to get. It's it's been moved over in a later plan. It's going to be over here. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, moving that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then this was just a little sitting area outside looking at the art or looking, you know, just little, little rooms outside these little walls. So also looking because we're looking this way. So that's north. So looking 
this way is looking straight out at the Pacific Ocean, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll see that uh, as we go. This is a, here's civil plan one. Here's more details of the kind of the drainage Area systems. Drain, drain. And we and we have a, we have a force line to go. We're pumping our sewer up the road and into the um, city sewer on the top of the hill, which is about. So, so you remember the ejector pump that I shot? I'm just talking to class. Yeah. That I shot at Grossman. You, these guys have an ejector pump as well. So we have one. Ejector. Yeah, we have one in the basement, and then we have one um, in the lift station that goes up to the to the which has two motors, two two. So that pushes it up uh, about 50 feet high, uh, up in the air, up the road. Yeah. Yep. Oh, really? Oh, my. Yeah. So this is all. Uh, 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 no, one, one station. Oh, God. Yep. So uh, it's a two inch, basically, it's a two inch line. So this is a site plan. Not, not, no, it's not quite. The landscaping is at the end of this. Which we'll see, but we can we can see that we're in the garage. Right? Yeah, right here, mm -hmm. right behind this through, through this door here. Yeah, right. As we go into the house and the three bedrooms and all that. Too. Yeah. So we'll take a look at that too. So I'm going to go to the floor plan right now. This is um. And it's single level stuff. It's single level with a gym below. Um, it, so it's got e yeah, we'll see. yeah, it's got a sauna and it's got a steam shower and it's really nice. Now, are these all connected? Is everything connected? Yeah. So, so no, but it is kind of so, uh, this um, separate. This being the um, north wing and this being the south wing, and in the between, in between here is this uh, glass structure. This is all glass here, glass door. You're going to see right through to the backside. This is glass here, and this is at this level. And then you go down seven feet to a landing here. Then you go outside because we are on a slope. So that then that, that's going that way. And then we got another stairs going down here, which will go into the basement, which covers this area out here the below. below. Yeah. And then if here's the so you come so here's your garage. You have a walking, you don't see it here, but you got the walking path coming in the front door. You, you come into the foyer and this is all wide open. And we'll see that. We'll see that. You come down the hall here and go into the great room. Here's the kitchen. Here's the pantry. Here's the dining kind of uh, a breakfast area to look out on the ocean. This is covered um, deck all the way around the house. That's concrete, wow. you know. And that's going to get tiled with the rest of it. Tile decking. Yeah, it's all tiled. Everything's going to be tiled except for the uh, the master bedroom and the office. Uh, are going to be wood as well as these three bedrooms are going to be wood floor. But the rest of it is going to be a Pietra Serena um, limestone. So um, and that's coming. That's on its way over from Italy right now. Yeah. They're going to get quarried. Well, no, it's, they went to a quarry, but right there, yeah. So here we got a couple of Teslas, and here's a. Do you Tesla. know what part of uh, Italy? Anywhere near Brescia? Do you know? I don't know. Because I have been in Brescia. Brescian marble is this really orange marble. Oh. And it's like from you know five miles away, you just see this orange. Yeah. Away oh, nice, nice. Nice. Yeah. I didn't. I you know I never saw one when I was in Italy. A couple of times. Um, so this, uh, what this is, is the main level reflected oh, ceiling plan, okay? What's happening on the ceilings? The coffered ceilings, in, lighting, right? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Here's the lights here that you'll see, what we can see. That's just going to look like a strip in the ceiling. There's not going to, you're not going to see any on the other light, other than light coming out of there. It's huh. all very, very, all covered up. And so you just see a very clean. Now, yeah. Are these all skylights? Those are skylights. And which one did you fall through? I fell through this one. Oh my God. <laughs> and bounced off a table, I think. Good Lord. Yeah. And you didn't hit the bed. And my plan table was below there because there was light <laughs> when we were framing. Look at the back. Look, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. That counts thirteen. Just fourteen. Oh my gosh. I mean, this is a big. Thirteen. Uh, it's not a little openable. No. No, but again, um, so you know, these are ridge skylights. So here, these two. So in this great room, this is a ridge skylight. Yeah. 
I mean, the whole virtual the whole length of the room with these really sexy lights yeah. that are just slits in the ceiling, right? And he really wanted a wine cellar or a wine room. Yeah. So he, this is our wine room. We spent an inordinate amount of money trying to make that into a wine room because there was just not a lot of room for it. Um, so, I know, I know, but here's what I asked, I, I told him to do. I said, when we had, we had to, because of the soil here, we had to um, dig this down 12 feet. So we dug, this was, we dug this down 12 feet below this. I'll show you the, I'll show you the, um, the this is the gym below. And these are stairs. This is the only, uh, Lower elevation. This is the only lower elevation. Yeah, but it's it's actually bigger than it looks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's a little better. Um, so you walk down the stairs to this landing and then you go outside. That's the back the back door. Um, that's seven feet down from here. So from the, the, the elevation grade from here to there is seven feet. And that's the that's the natural grade out there, this is natural grade here. So in that space, you, 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 it's, this is pretty steep. But this is all at the same level. <clears throat> uh, bath, sauna, storage and mechanical, and then there's a big old room to yeah. work out in. It makes me want yeah. to sweat right now. <laughs> this is this covered patio outside, is that what that yeah, is? Yeah, this is covered patio. And there's, uh, this doesn't show up, but there's actually a garden here and the stairs coming up. And is it all. something cantilevers above that is, there's a, there's um yeah this is a moment frame now this is um the Simpson uh moment strong wall moment frame but it's the, these are I beams this is a, uh -huh. this is, we have two of them in the building one of the on the other level so, so you drag Simpson it moment frame Simpson custom that's pretty cool because well it's but it's no 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 this no. is really this is yeah this is really you spend more on the Simpson moment frame than you would on a custom one. Well, I guess the, uh, you, they do the engineering still, you know, it's just sort of like they got their name on it, but it's, it's, it's pretty they, custom. They build it before yeah. this opens. Yeah, obviously. yeah, it's a height and everything, you know, yeah. and they have some uh, interesting things. But it all bolts together, right? Bolts, bolts together. together. So mm -hmm. the welding's all done in the factory. Yeah. Where, where typically a lot of moment frame custom stuff, there's site welding. And right, stuff. right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's, uh, let's go back to here. Um, so what's interesting about it <clears throat> so we okay we are going to take a break <clears throat> we're going to take a let me take a look here let me stop the share for a second we're going to take a break i've got um i've got 17 2 take a break again uh, we'll come back at 5 2 Come back at five minutes until 11, please, and I'll see you then, okay? See you at five to 11. Kill the recording, Rodney. Thank you, buddy. God, you're good. <laughs> Click. All right, it's five until 12. I'm going to uh, talk for a minute, and then I'm gonna show I want to show a few more of uh, the videos of John Moore, the house. Catherine, uh, Catherine texted me and thought that she had seen this video, that I had shown this video, but I've never shown you this video. Now, if you've clicked on it yourself, because it's been up for a couple of weeks, I've kind of been moving it around. That's one thing, but we haven't seen it. Am I the only one that saw it? Sorry about that. Yeah. Am I yeah. the only one? John, did you see it? Okay. No, I, Sorry I, about I, that, Rodney. Maybe yeah. you were good yeah, and post we're... put it on the... Uh, you put it on your um, canvas, so that was cool. Yeah, yeah, I've had, had that stuff up. I don't know. You know, I, I don't wait to publish. I figure, you know, if people want to take the time to watch stuff beforehand, that's great. I love it. Um, uh, I, I'm going to make a few comments, and then I'm going to go back to John. I was planning to do breakout rooms today, but I think what I'm going to do is push ahead and watch some of these videos, because for me, they hopefully for you, it gets even more interesting. And I'm gonna try to get us out of here early, or then, um, if that's if that's okay with everybody, it's just kind of a, a uh, an Easter present, right? A pre-Easter present. I didn't have any chocolate bunnies. Well, the truth is, I didn't have enough chocolate bunnies for everybody, 
and I didn't have enough marshmallow eggs for everybody. And why is it these dang holidays are all about ruining your teeth anyway, or your skin? Okay, so um, I noticed a couple of things. I made a couple of notes. You may not know what a moment frame is. Um, uh, and I should probably get a, uh, should probably get an exact definition. Moment frame. According to Wikipedia, moment resisting frame is a rectilinear assemblage of beams and columns with the beams rigidly connected to the columns. All right, I'll buy that. Uh, when, when jobs are called out for a structural moment frame, they're typically called out, well, not typically, they're called out as a steel frame. So they, they, there's a, the, the moment means something and I'm sorry, it's escaping me right now, but it, it adds sheer and strength and structure to the building. They're almost always steel. I've built plenty of houses, three-story houses with lots of moment frames, but they were all custom, uh, made by custom welding shops. Now, I guess Simpson, who is the big company that makes all the connectors, all our hardware connectors and hangers and hold downs, they also make moment frames. And they make them to your spec. Uh, and I, I'll bet they're cheaper too. So that, that's a moment frame. And if you need more explanation on a moment frame, I can give that to you maybe later. Um, uh, my contractor's license, I'll, I'll tell you the story. I'll go ahead and tell you the story. Uh, and I don't know what the, theodolite is. It's a surveying tool. I suspect it's a, he talked about the chain. We used to drag a chain. That was a hundred foot chain, an actual chain that didn't get any bigger than 100 feet was how they surveyed uh, before they came up with the laser tools that they use. So I'm gonna try to find out about theodolite. I don't know if I will, but um, I wanna explain door pans and, uh, I'll, I'll, and I wanna tell you my contractor's license story. So I'm gonna try to make this fast. So if you were listening, John, we were talking about the contractor's license test. When I took mine in 1881, he took his in 1983. They were relatively esoteric. He, he, he said he passed, he passed the law part, he failed the trade part. Well, that's um, easy to understand because the trade part, they give you three hours to do a test. You have an hour break and then you come back. You have 90 minutes to do the, the law part. The law part is about contract law and mechanics lien law, and it's not that tough. You study it, you, uh, it's, it's um, not that hard. The trade part, on the other hand, now it's all done. Um, you know, you go down to an, a place, you get a little workstation, you do it all on a computer, you know if you passed or not. When John and I took it, we went down to Pasadena, we're in a room with 100 people or so and we had a proctor for every two people and we took this test and the three hour trade test was ridiculously esoteric now what i mean by that is it just seemed like it had all this secret knowledge right like you had to know a bunch of stuff about electrical and a bunch of stuff about plumbing that no general contractor would know wouldn't anyway wouldn't have it in his head he'd ask upc the universal plumbing code or um uh, the electrical code, he'd ask his electrician, but you were expected to know these things to pass the test. Now, at the time, this was known that it was really hard to pass this test. So there were these schools. So I, I paid 600 bucks to go to this school. And a big part of the money was that they guaranteed that your app, they would fill out your application, submit your application with your certificates, um, certifying your experience as a journeyman and above for four years out of the, uh, out of 10, a 10 year period, that they guaranteed your application would be accepted and you'd get a test date. Okay, so I got a test date. Well, I got the postcard from the CSLB, Contractor State License Board, that my test was gonna be in 21 days. I was going, oh man, 21 days, I gotta start studying. So I started going to this school. Well, this school for the trade and the law part did not have you, the study materials were not uh, they were not, uh, they were not about construction. They were not about the business part of construction. They were tests. So you didn't learn content. You just took tests, right? They had like six, eight, 10, 12 different tests. And you just took tests, took tests, took tests, took tests, took tests. You took tests. I, I took like two or three or 10 tests a day every day until I'd see the question, the read the first three answers of the question, and I would know which answer it was. 
they handed out plans. There were about five or six sets of plans because part of the test at the end, you have to do a takeoff. You have to take off, well, for instance, the question might be lineal foot of uh, sole plate, uh, lineal foot of all three plates, uh, the length of the joist, the amount of joist, the number of joists, the number of studs, stuff like that, right? On a, on a plan that you would get uh, at the test site. Well, they had sample tests. So flash forward, fast forward, 21 days later, my test date. I go down to Pasadena, I get a motel room the day before. I study that night. I study the plans. I take off the plans. You know, I, I familiarize myself with the plans I got. The one set out of six or seven that they're maybe going to use, I don't know. I have no idea what to expect. The next day, I show up there bright and early, whenever it is, eight o'clock, and there's all these people in the room. There's proctors that are, you know, um, they're watching you to make sure you're not cheating and doing all the stuff you're supposed to be doing. Bang, they start the bell, right? You have three hours to do this test. I can't remember how many questions. The trade part, the most esoteric hard part. They were the exact questions that this school had given me to study. I mean, they weren't like, kind of the questions, like the questions, they were the questions. So literally, as fast as I could read the question, I went to the answer. And sometimes I could just read the first couple of two or three words, because I had been so used to taking these tests, I got out of there in 32 minutes. 32 minutes for a three hour test. People were looking at me like, what? What? Where's that guy going? Yeah, 32 minutes. So I went and killed two, uh, two and a half hours, and then another hour. So I went and killed three and a half hours. Oh, this is, this is even better. At the end of that trade part, the last of the questions was a set of plans to do a takeoff on. They were the set of plans I had, the ones I'd been looking at that morning. So when it, caught, when it wanted to know the number of, of floor joists, I already knew how many. I didn't even have to look at the, it was insane. So I went and did something for three and a half hours, came back for the law part. It took me 11 minutes to do the 90 minutes law test. So I went out of there doing backflips and I passed, by the way. They don't tell you what you pass by, but I suspect I passed by a high, a high number and I got a contractor's license. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. But I went back to the contractor's license board and took another test for another license about... 12 years ago, um, as it turned out, it, it, uh, legally, I couldn't advertise as a cabinet maker. I couldn't advertise my commercial cabinet shop without a, a, a cabinet making, a C6 specialty license, which is cabinet making, finished work, and millwork, finished carpentry and millwork. So I thought, you know, I'm going to take the test. So I applied for it. I got a test date. And I thought, I'm not going to study. I, you know, I've been a cabinet maker, formally trained. I've been in the business for three decades. I ought to know my stuff. And that uh, kind of last minute, the night before I took the test in Oxnard, I did crack the um, woodworking manufacturer's book, the our Bible, our uh, WIC Bible, Woodworking Institute of California, actually. And I, I just kind of skimmed and looked at a couple of stuff. I'm really glad I did. Because I took the test the next day, and when you answer the questions on the screen and you got a whiteboard to play with, it says, Are you sure you're done? You click yes, and it was like, immediately, you passed. And I imagine it would say immediately, you didn't pass or you failed. But in my case, it said you passed. So some of those questions, I, I needed to look at what I did look. But what I found out by taking that test, what, um, 20, 30 years later, that the test now seemed germane to the trade. It wasn't all this weird esoteric stuff that nobody would expect you to know. So I, I suspect that, and, and you had heard a lot over the years that they have been making the test better because they didn't really relate to what everybody was doing in construction. So, so test is better now. And uh, John mentioned door pans. Door pans for a uh, 
for an exterior door, not an interior door. You would never use this in an interior door. Um, so, and a cross section, side view, right? If this is a wall, an exterior wall, sole plate, right? Sits on a slab. That's the slab. There's grade. There's a slab. If you're putting a door in this opening, it needs a door pan. Let's see if I can draw this in some kind of perspective for you. I don't know how good a perspective that is. Um, that's a wall. But anyway, if this is the opening the door goes in, a door pan, we make them out of stainless steel or copper. We used to make them out of galvanized metal, but we don't anymore because galvanized sheet metal does not hold up. Door pan goes down here with a nice bead of caulk. And the pan, stainless steel, goes runs up about six inches up. Runs the whole way, six inches up that trimmer, and it comes down about four inches, and it goes in. So on a side view, yeah, which I did there, but if this is the slab, on a side view, your door pan turns up. So whatever the width of your jam is, right? So if this is your jam, your stainless steel turns up, it runs underneath the jam and it turns down the face and it's caulked in, at least there and there and maybe there, it's caulked in. Stainless steel, so it's not gonna go away. Copper's not gonna go away. It's not gonna rust, it's not gonna deteriorate. It's gonna be there for a long, long time. And what it does is once that jam is dropped down, that's the jam of the door, the door if the door swings in, the door's in here like that, it swings in. But any water that gets under this jam or threshold rather, this would be the say the door threshold like that. Any water that gets in here is gonna be stopped by the caulk, right? And it gets in between the stainless steel and it's not gonna make it up and over this. Finished floor butts to that. That would be your finished floor. So no water is going to get past that. You'd have to, you'd have to, you know, if you get a flood, if the water is above this, it's going to come in your house. But if water is just trying to get blown in here, or if it kind of fills up with a big puddle, and, and it water wants to come into your house, it's going to get stopped. It's going to get stopped. That's what the door pan is about. It's going to protect the sides. And, and I know that may not be as clear as uh, a bell to everybody. But I can't explain better later, probably a better drawing. But I just, I know John mentioned it. So I wanted to, uh, I wanted you guys to see it. Okay, let's go to. <clears throat> oh, that was three, right? All right, we're back to closed captioning. Good deal. Re the, uh, Doug just out. It had to recompact us. We had storms. Uh, that was last place. Uh, that was 2019. Um, storms. And 2020 has been pretty, pretty, pretty easy winter. You know, we haven't really had so, or we had storms one storm after another after another when we were 12 feet down and trying to get this back up and we covered the dirt that was there we had mounds of dirt all over the site there was huge amount of dirt and we had to cover that with plastic when the rains came so it didn't get um um it didn't get saturated and we couldn't use it for fill here's um here's uh ian i mean uh ingo this is ingo crook crook we're not sure but he's the electrician on the job. You, know, you just look like you're getting ready to hold up a liquor store. That's Ingo? Yeah, that's Ingo. Sure? That's yeah. it. That's it. Let's see your face. It's Ingo. <laughs> I mean, I go way back. Me yeah? The book house? Oh, are you kidding me? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, the book building. So I'm going to pause this because okay. do you have to ask John a question? No. No? 
Okay, then maybe I'll keep going because we're going to go outside. Oh, okay. Um, let's roll off one walk through the house. Or yeah, yeah. So, um, so anyway, well, I just want to tell you that with the wine cellar being here, when we were down this far down, I asked the guy if he wanted to, because you come down the stairs here to this landing, mm -hmm. and then you go down here. Right under here, I could have made him the most bitchin' wine cellar. And probably cost per square foot a lot less than that one, <laughs> but uh, but that one it would have been well into the into the earth and yeah. yeah. But getting stuff out. The problem with this house is it was very very hard to get um, um, pipes and vents and ducts. There's no place for them to come from one side to the other. So we have water coming in both sides. So the water's coming in here, being conditioned, and then coming back out. Or another entry here. We have gas going in both sides because we can't get across it. Across, you know, yeah. And it's the big problem. I just did the uh, NTAC guide. That guy, John Lavar, and that was the big thing to get service entry yeah. across vaulted ceilings. And Where there's no attic, there's no, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is flat roofs. We have some flat roofs, but we don't have an attic. We have like a. In some, it, some area. No, we're all framed. We're all. Somebody's not going to do it. So um, let's take a walk. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything walk. else you want to no, look at there? No, okay. If you wanted to, let me, um, I think I'll just walk around. Okay. <laughs> this is, um, I just put this in because I'm going to move my office in, or a storage, make this into a storage area yeah. so I can get rid of that uh, uh, trailer. Yeah. yeah. So it's going this trailer right here, is, which has been your job site. Trailer. Yes. Uh -huh. Get rid of that. Yeah, because we, we need to do some exterior grading. Here, yeah, that's in the way. Need that room. Yeah, so we're going to come this in is, here. This is, a, this is a bicycle. This is actually bicycle, bicycle storage. storage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. So we're coming in the back, the door between the garage and the house. We're walking into where, if I remember, there's three bedrooms. Yep, there's three bedrooms, and these bedrooms each have a closet and a. And this is the this is the uh, powder room first. That's off the hall there. That's the entry closet, which will be made up into um, three compartments uh, with doors on them. Is this the entry house? Yeah, yes. Well, let's go. Let's go in the front door. We don't bring you in the back door. So here's the here's the front door. We can step back a little bit and see. This is exterior siding, and there's siding here. John uh, John Mosley. So here's the front door. This is all glass, that whole wall, yeah. and the steel. All glass, glass and steel. Yeah. This is very different. Yeah. Is this all clear storage? Is this all yeah, that's, 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 that's glass. Door. This is glass. Yeah, yeah. This comes next next week. This is, this is what we call it, the atrium. And so you come, you come here. Oops. The solar flare. Okay. So here, look at here's our stairs. These are our um, it's uh, three quarter inch plate steel cut. We're going to put four by twelves on the top of them. We're looking for some reclaim. Yeah. Is this just dreamed up? Is it dreamed up? So that's three quarter inch plate. Yeah. Cut, cut out what yeah. one piece? Because it was well one piece. Yeah. So it's three. Yeah. So we talked about total rise, total run, unit rise, unit run. We'll, yep. we'll talk about that a little bit more of it. Yeah. Holy crow, that CIP, the casting place, concrete in this place. And this is, is this all overhead pour here? Or is no, this is all unfilled. brand new. This is all. Uh, is that on fill? Yes. Right yes. Uh -huh. Okay. So, so this is just retaining CIP, wall. Yep. And fill, compacted fill, and then. Yep. And then a slab over that. And then over here was, we'll, go, we'll get to that when we get to that. So I thought I'd show you those. And that's okay. going down to the bed. Okay. So we're back filming. I think I might have. Uh, I might have been out of battery, so I might have come off. I wanted to show you this entry again. Go ahead, no, Don't worry. Yeah, this is sliding. This is a Koya. It's all what? 
Oh, oh yeah, well, pretty much, pretty much. We have some face nails of, of pin nails on the plate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In this glass, this glass will come across here, go into here. This is this going to be a glass corner. Oh yeah, but that a minor corner. Yep. Yeah. And then this is going to have glass panels. Yeah, this is going to be a glass, and then there's going to be a glass door into it that we just entered in. If you can feel it. And then is this all? These are all minor too. These are minor to all. Um, these are um, these are running outside these outside this, but they are um, they're paneled. Now this this here is going to be a top one. It's going to be an L. It's going to fit in in there. Yeah. Not a glass. Uh, so that so all those corners are mitered glass. They don't have anything supporting the corners. The glass miters. So you just have a glass corner. It's good. You know, I, if, you, if somebody reminds me, I'll go back and film this in a month or so, and let's see if, if we can see this entry with glass, and it. it'll be unreal. Um, a guy from Arizona. Fatek Graham. You know, I um. Yeah, because of JNL. Because they couldn't, I mean, um, this guy met the FRC um, requirements, which is the solar solar requirements on Title 2024. And he was able to make the, get the glass, and it's a rainier glass. They had to go to Europe to get it. That's what the green cone is right now. So you gotta, it's not real good for the econ our economy, actually, in some ways. No ways it is. Um, <clears throat> so this is so yeah, all. He, 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 no, he's just doing this. Yeah, and those two door and that door in the window. And, but this is an insane amount of glass. So yeah. we're in the house now, right? Yep, yep. So that's going to be plaster. This is going to be plaster. Now, now, what about this? Are we all interior here too? This is all interior. No, this is there's going to be a railing right here, huh. and then the staircase going down to the landing, and that's. Open or just glass? No, that's glass again. Yep. Okay, this so is all conditioned all space. Conditioned glass. Yep, all conditioned. See that register? Oh my God, register there and register here. Yeah. This is going to be filled with glass. You know what's this? What's this tall? Is that just going to be a big the, glass panel? Those columns? Yeah, that's glass panel with a door. Yeah, that's all glass. <laughs> <laughs> that's all glass. <laughs> that's all glass. <laughs> Giant panel or a bunch of yeah. I'll show that. I'll show you on the on the, on the exterior. Yeah. Then this is going to be a plaster roof right here, all clean, uh, and it's going to float in the glass. You know, you're just gonna. It's going to look like whoa. How do they do that? Yeah, like the ceiling's just floating. Yeah. Mass on the sides of it. It's like you got a clear story. Sometimes there's a clear story window to give light into two bathrooms in there, into the powder room and into bathroom number one. So that's the whole purpose of that. Hey, Jerry, how you doing, man? Good, how are you? Good. Okay, so now, we now we're coming down. The bedroom wing. We're, now we're yeah. going to the main living room wing. Yep, yep. And this is the called the great room, and we showed that on the plans. This is the, this is, take a, so if you could, let me. Yep. Yep. It is really hard to see the view until we open these. See, you see how the doors stack and see how easy it is to push them? Um, when you can put two on them, it's a little more, but uh, so we could all motorize those as well, but uh, this is. Yeah, and then this will this, watch this will go pocket into here. So the plaster is going to finish right here. All you'll see is that's got to go back in a little bit. Oh, no more corners. Yeah, come over here, Ronnie, and I'll show you. So this floor is going to be um, limestone, and the limestone is going to come up to here. This is just this is just up, up, it's going to get buried by limestone. No. So this is so this is buried by limestone. Limestone is going to be cut in here and in here. All you're going to see is these these little curves. Yeah. So they'll, they'll float this, I guess, yeah. to build it up to the, unless the limestone yeah. is that thick. Yeah, no. We're two and a quarter inches down because they didn't know what the floor was going to be and they wanted to allow. And plus, 
plus this is two and a quarter inch off the slab. So that's, and the thick is the uh, limestone is three quarter. Yeah. <laughs> but this it's it's good to have a really it doesn't have to yeah. yeah. And then so this is exterior. This is exterior. This is why we have all this expanded metal lap because yep. it's all exterior plaster. Yep. Okay, so this one goes four skylights. Yeah, and here's the other moment frame. You can't see it now, but this has taken up a lot of the shear load of this building rotating. Yeah, there's all these columns and then the Tied together with some kind of beam all the way across, right? Yep. Well, there's two by twelve. There's beams here. Under this, there's there's a beam running from. See that beam there, the red steel. Yeah. yeah. And that ties into this one. Uh, that one ties into it, and it ties into the moment frame there, mm -hmm. and then it ties in over here to another column of a steel column. See the steel columns along here? There's yeah, one, yeah. two, six six. three. I think there's four of them. Yeah. Jimmy? Yeah. In this blue. Some of the contemporary, some of the aspects of contemporary that really make it tough are um, tolerances. You don't have a lot of slop. No, it's there's no place. The ceilings. There's no place to hide. No, no casing to cover stuff up. There's no shimmy. There's everything. It's got to be level. I mean, it's got to be plumb and level. level. And, and like flat. these, door, or these doors don't open. Oh yeah, flat and straight, yep. Because look at this, there's no trim on this door up here. So it's the, that exterior plaster. Plaster will come right into it. It's gonna come and ground yeah. right up, zoom on that. It's gonna come and ground right up there. Yep. And there is no room for error. You right. gotta, these doors have gotta be right. They gotta be sitting dead level, yep. dead plumb. Absolutely, so as does the floor. Uh, you know the the, the sill plate and the sill has to. By the way, concrete cracks. So, yeah. All concrete cracks. My concrete is guaranteed. Yeah, but to crack. Yeah, guaranteed to crack. No, mm -hmm. right. I'm saying yeah. no control joints needed because this is all going to slip sheet and. Yeah, yeah, it'll get red guard maybe painted. And yeah, and limestone. So. Mm -hmm. And this is sloped off here. And between the mortar bed and the slip sheet. Inch and a half more of it. You don't have any cracking. No, I shouldn't think. I hope not. But um, this is going to be stairs down into the outside kitchen. This is this is the outside oh, kitchen here. This is an outside kitchen. Yeah. Like hardscape stairs going down and it'll stand down here. And this has got a top on it. This outside kitchen. No. So no. Nope. Just out to the. Yep. This, yep. Is you're, this is what you're looking at. That's, uh, that's a university point, yeah. The mountain. Yeah, it's got a beautiful, um, yeah, site. This. this is not an infinity pool because there was too many trees to, to make it an infinity. That would break the. It's still in all. Did you get to pull in first? Pull in one of the first things, yeah. I got this backhoe first. Well, I got this, I got this in, and then this came, then after that, this came in while we still had room. Yeah. yeah. Well, we got the slab in the gym done first, and then brought those walls up because those, and then we, we were going to just top, uh, put a, a topping on this slab and do some addition to it. But as I say, it was, it was moving. We found rattlesnakes under the slab. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Live rattlesnakes? Yeah. And, and a dad who we're just talking to, he had a rattlesnake in his in his bucket of tools or a bucket of pipes. Yeah. Oh my God. Little one. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. And of course, you can grab a jacuzzi as part of it. Yeah. More of a lap pool. Yeah, this is for grandkids. Yeah. So let me show you what you don't want to do <clears throat> is you don't want to make decisions after the fact. You want to plan it. So there's been a lot of planning while we're building. 
Right. So you've had to kind of stop and go. Yeah. Okay, this didn't get made initially. So now, so now we had to tear this this lap on because he wants a bug screen from here to there to there to there. So we do this a temporary wall here, a bug screen to go drop down and keep mosquito out. Oh. So he can open these windows because these don't windows uh, these doors don't come with screens. Yeah. See, this is this is another corner that opens. You know, and that's the main, that's the master bedroom. Sure. And so this is like inside outside now. This all view. We'll have bug screen here. Yeah. Yep. Yep. They're going to be recessed. Yeah. See, we got to cut all this. See, see, this is what we did. You got to head this stuff out. Yeah. See, we put this uh, uh, LDL in there. It created that. It created that recess. Now we got to do it here. Okay. So here's the recess. Here's the pocket. Yeah. And now you're going to do that. I call it just putting the solar flash. Now you're going to do that up here. Yeah. And so we had to move this plumbing pipe because it was in the way. Because we got to get a six. This is a roof drain. Yeah. 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 Just, dude, I mean, they just keep coming. Yeah. Problem is problem. Yeah. And now look at here. Here you're going to get power to the sky. To the yeah. And that's going to go into the into yeah. the vent when, when it comes. Yeah. When we when we get the pocket in here. So I'm going to have Jerry. Oh, screens like that. This is a main product. It's a made as um, um, Lutron makes them, but this is another soapy uh, soapy product. Um, the Southern California screen uh, company that does it. So they're out of Canada Park. So here, then we have a recessed crack on the side here, and this doesn't have enough room. I mean, it just barely has enough room. No, no, so it'll just barely have enough room because this is half inch plus uh, plus one inch. So it's an inch and a half. We got another three quarters. So it's two and an eighth is the depth of the of the. It's just next to here, the, the, for the track for the for the curtain to run in. You know, the screen. But look it up here. Big trouble. We're gonna cut that steel. You just cut, cut it off. The white plan. Yep. Yep. In the bowl, you just got to deal with a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. There yeah. To, 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 to cause this create cracks, got to go all the way. Yeah. So we got to have one over there, too. Yep. We have to have a pocket up there. Oh, shit. So what are you going to do with that? What do we plumb the drain? Uh, move the drain? At least the, the piping for the drain? Yeah, he, he came and moved it, but it's not over there. Oh. There are so many details, not to mention, um, you know, the stuff that comes up with like, oh, okay, we're here now. It's yeah. It's been addressed by the architect or the engineer. What do yeah. we do? Yeah. Not to and mention so, stuff like this, which is, oh, yeah, we forgot the screen. We forgot to get those screen. Well, he tossed it. We asked, we put, him, put that to him, you know, months and months ago, and he just couldn't make a decision because, it, I don't know, you know, people have a hard time deciding sometimes, and sometimes they can make quick snap decisions. If he was at one of those, he would have saved a lot of time and a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So time big money. Yeah. I'm just so intrigued by this master. Jerry. Jerry. Yeah. What are you working on? You oh, looking for something? Can you me over if they do that, that outside bed thing? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I, make a I made a but, I made a drawing. So but we don't have uh Tyler. Yeah, we got, we got, we got, we got probably some here and some there, but let me, excuse me one second, Randy. Let me show you what I'm Okay, I, I think I'm going to stop at Whole House 4. Um, there's three more videos in the Whole House um, in this uh, set, which we'll, maybe we'll see them next week. Because then we talk a bit about that clear story and some, I think some really interesting things. So I, I really want you to see this because there's some details that you don't always see. You don't often see that are interesting.
and just to see that they could, how they can pull this stuff off. Um, I want to let us go early today, but um, and so I'm not going to do breakout rooms. I'm not going to show the last of the video. I am going to say um, a couple of things. So I mentioned that um, contemporary houses can have problems um, because they have uh, so little uh, room for slot. So just one detail, one detail only in that house. And, there, and there's a you know there's dozens of these details that have to do with the contemporary aspect, which is the trimless aspect. So there's no trim. So if you were if you had an interior wall, then kind of a regular house. And you, you had a doorway, and let's let's say this is an eight foot ceiling. Pretty typical. You had a doorway in the middle of it, this wall, an exterior doorway. There was a for a regular door, which is a six eight door, eighty two inch header height. So in here you've got a header at eighty two, and you've got a trimmer stud and a king stud. Same thing over here on an exterior door. Um, you know, ultimately, in a typical house, you're going to have casing or trim. So it's going to get, let's just say, typically mitered casing. It's going to frame out that door and that door jam. And so you're going to have, you know, you've got all this room up here to put casing on. You've got um, room around the door to, to cover up any, uh, the fact that the rough opening maybe is not uh, plumb or level. You're going to be able to set your door plumb and level, and then with shims, and then cover that um, the spaces with casing. So you'll never know that the opening was at a plumb and level. In a house like John's doing, that's contemporary, and you've got a a wall. It's an exterior wall. In this case, it's like. 12 foot tall or 10 foot tall. That's a problem in itself. But you've got these doors, right, that are planing all the way up to the lid. So in side view, if this is the wall and this is the ceiling, instead of having, you know, an opening down here with a jam in it, and casing, you've got an opening all the way up here. It's got no trim. And then you got to get that jam in and then have the ceiling plain to it. So your ceiling has got to be dead flat, dead level. Your walls have got to be dead plumb. I mean, you've got, you just don't have room for slop. And so I know you're probably saying to yourself, or maybe you're not saying to yourself, but I'm saying to myself, hey, well, shouldn't walls and ceiling just be dead plumb and level anyway? And, and isn't that something that we expect in building? Is dead plumb, uh, plumb and level ceilings and walls and flat and straight? No. You, well, yeah, you'd think so, right? But no, that's not, that's not the norm. The norm is not flat and not straight and not plumb and not level. I don't know why I've done this so many years and I'm still amazed. Like that house that we're doing at the Mangones in 30 feet slabs an inch and a quarter out of level. That's problems, except in this case, we don't have the kind of contemporary planing in and no trim. So we have some options to, uh, to adjust those things that are out of plumb and out of level. But some of the things in a house, uh, any kind of a building, have to be set plumb and level. Cabinets need to be plumb and level, dead plumb, dead level, no exceptions.
windows, doors, plumb and level. Even now in, you know, in, in, in walls that are out the plumb that you're casing and you want your jam to follow the wall so your casing works so you don't have a wall like this and a jam like that. Sometimes you have to hang your doors slightly out of plumb or you split the difference, but that's finished carpenter stuff that we'll talk about later. It's uh, 1237. I was going to try to get out of here by 1230 is my gift to you for this Saturday morning is out of here before noon. Do we do we have any questions? Is there anybody um, that would like to ask uh, me any questions before we break for today? Anybody, anybody out there with any questions, any burning questions? C Catherine, stick around when I say bye and we can talk for a minute or two if you got it, uh, if you got a minute. And John, I'll talk to you later. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm thinking no questions. Enjoy your weekend. You now know all know when Easter occurs. So you can amaze your family and your friends with that knowledge because you can go around all day today and go, hey, do you know when Easter occurs? <laughs> oh, good, because I do. Because now you know, right? It's the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. That's Easter. And Easter is a phenomenally cool holiday, I think. It's a holiday I absolutely believe in. Rebirth and resurrection. Mm, it's good stuff. So I'll see you guys. I won't see you next Saturday. I'll see you the week following Saturday. Uh, we'll finish with Whole House. I'll have some new stuff for you to look at. Um, might, you might want to travel back into sound insulation, tell you a little bit about my sound studio experience and about sound isolation. And then we'll see what Jim's, uh, what James has got going. I think oh, well, I've, I'll, have, he'll have, I'll have caught up to him. So I'm going to be having, I have some drywall stuff I'm going to show you. Interview with a drywall contractor, some drywall um, being hung, stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Hey, happy Easter to you all. Great to see you. Take care. Happy Easter. See you, Rodney. Yeah. Happy yeah. Easter. Everybody, see you soon. Real soon. Oh, I got some chats in here. See you. Bye, Katie. Trouble hearing. Carry each other cross check. Hearing and translating. More brain. Hey, Rodney. Yes. Hi. Hey, 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 girl. Let me just, I'm finishing this chat. Okay, take your time and make sure recording is off. Hi, recording. Yes.